Well, let's begin with <clears throat> a definition 6.4. So we're going to suppose that we've got a real valued function on a compact interval AB of the real numbers. Then we're going to take a partition of that interval. And so let's just say that P is going to look like um, X sub 0, X1, all the way up to X sub N being B. Then we're going to define delta F sub K as being um, the difference in the function at the right endpoint of the subinterval minus the function value at the left sub endpoint of the subinterval. Um, so it's just f sub k minus f sub k minus 1. And we'll have one of those for each one of the values. Um, k equals 1 to n. Now, if we have uh, some m, some positive number m, such that um, if we look at the variation, and so this is how we'll denote our variation, this sum, this sigma sub f of p, um, so the variation with respect to p um, of our function is just going to be the sum from k equals 1 to n of the absolute value of those delta f sub k's. Now, if there's uh, an m greater than 0, such that um, all of our variations with respect to every single partition is bounded above by m, <coughs> then we say that f is said to be of bounded variation on the closed interval a, b. And typically, we'll end up denoting that by um, this BV and then whatever interval we happen to be talking about. So bounded variation of the closed interval a, b. Now, for a function that is of bounded variation on that closed interval a, b, then we'll take the least upper bound, so the supremum over all possible partitions of a, b, so the supremum of the variance over all possible partitions of a, b, um, we'll say that that is the total variation of the function on the closed interval a, b. So that's a little bit of an abstract definition. And so at this point, if you've not had any experience with anything like this, a very, very natural question to ask is that what exactly are we measuring with this definition? And so what we really have, if we take a close look at this picture, we've got our partition down here at the bottom, x0, x1, x2, x3, x4. <clears throat> then we've got our function. We're taking function values um, with respect to that partition. And then the how much ground we're covering is really <coughs> these vert the length of these vertical segments that we've got. So delta f sub 1 is going to be the length of that, delta f sub 2 the length of that, delta f sub 3 the length of that, and so on and so on. So if we take all of the, if we take the lengths of those segments and add them all up, then in this case, since our function is just increasing, we see that sure enough we get the function value at the right endpoint minus the function value at the left endpoint. And so what happens in this particular case when our function is increasing and it's decreasing, so we're not monotonic anymore? Well, if we take a particular partition, here it's kind of a rough partition, x0, x1, x2, x3, we still are calculating our, um, kind of our, how much ground we cover over each one of those subintervals. So we've got this absolute value of delta f sub 1, absolute value of delta f sub 2, and absolute value of delta f sub 3. So that's our variation with respect to this particular partition p. But what we're really missing is this function is really um, covering some ground that gets missed by this particular partition. So inside our interval x sub 1 and x sub 2, 
our function is really increasing more so it's increasing and then it's coming back down um, and so we're kind of missing how much ground is covered um, in this blue area here so this this partition doesn't actually capture everything and so we if we just would throw in another point here maybe if we threw in one at this maximum now we're going to catch all of the possible variation that this function has and so that's really the reason when we start talking about total variation that we take the supremum over all possible partitions and so that's really kind of going to be where our true measurement is coming from we'll take the measurement for one particular partition and then take the supremum over all of those other possible partitions so how much ground is actually covered by a monotonic function well we've kind of alluded to that in some of our previous pictures and we probably have um, a pretty good idea of that but let's go to theorem 6.5 and actually see what it says well if a function f is monotonic on a compact interval a b then sure enough f is of bounded variation on that and so um, since we're talking monotonicity without loss of generality let's just suppose that f is going to be increasing so we'll take any old partition p um, being x0 x1 all the way up to xn then we look at the absolute value of the function differences of so the absolute value of these delta f sub k's well because our function is increasing then f of x sub k minus f of x sub k minus 1 is always going to be positive and so we can just drop the absolute value signs to then give us f of x sub k minus f of x sub k minus 1 and that is our delta f sub k's so if we add all of those absolute values up well we can drop the absolute values this becomes a telescoping sum what are we left with the right end function at the right end point minus the function at the left end point which is just our f of b minus f of a and so what happens in that case that so the sum uh, our variation with of f with respect to the partition p is always just going to be f of b minus f of a and so if we look at um, the set of all variations of f um, over all partitions p that's just a singleton value of f of b minus f of a and so of course that means f is going to be um, a function of bounded variation and the variation just happens to be f of b minus f of a and so kind of one last theorem for this discussion um, if we've got a function that is of bounded variation then that function is bounded um, may seem kind of obvious that that's going to be true but <clears throat> in any case um, it is going to be bounded by the function value at the left endpoint um, plus whatever the total variation of that function is going to be across that interval so let's see if we can prove this all right so if we take an x value that's going to be on the interior of this interval a b then we're going to make an incredibly trivial partition p just being a x and b so that whenever we do the variation um, of f over this partition we just have two terms in our summation we're going to drop the second term and just have um, that being the absolute so the the variation of f over the partition is going to be greater than the absolute value of f of x minus f of a now we're going to use um, a fact about absolute values that if we have the absolute value of z minus w that's going to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of so the absolute value of the differences of the absolute values of the terms on the inside and so <clears throat> what that's going to give us is that the absolute value of the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of f of a is going to be less than or equal to the variation of f over the partition p that we had but that's going to be less than or equal to the least upper bound over all um, variations of partitions and so
and of dropping the absolute value bars, moving that over, we see that, yes, sure enough, that the absolute value of f of x is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of f of a plus the total variation of the function across that interval. Now, if we plug in x equal to b, then pretty much the same argument is going to hold um, for a partition um, of just a and b. Now if x is equal to a then we pretty much easily get from the definition of um, variation over a partition <clears throat> and then the least upper bound of that that the total variation of f over a b is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And so the last one is um, pretty much just a consequence of the definition that we're seeing directly and so this ends up proving our theorem.